to introduce uh, Robert Ross. I first met Robert about eight years ago. At a, he was a keynote speaker for a Chinese politics conference. And between panels, he snuck out, and I went with him, and he was uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And his search for the best barbecue in Louisville. <laughs> and he had a Google map, a Google treasure map, um, of where, the, where these were. And we finally went to a place, and the place we found, which was supposed to be one of the best, was closed. <laughs> and inside was the owner, was kind of cleaning up. Bob managed to talk to him, get him to open the place up and serve us. It was the best barbecue we had. It was very good. But it just shows that he has a tremendous amount of influence, not just over owners of, of barbecue places in Louisville, but uh, as a China expert, he's had a tremendous amount of influence on students, colleagues, and foreign policymakers in the United States. Um, there's very few people that I know have that much influence over that broad range of people. He's, uh, he is professor at Boston College. He is also an associate at the Fairbanks, uh, at, at, <laughs> I know this, right? The Fairbanks Center for East Asian Research at Harvard University. Um, he's a senior advisor for security studies at MIT. Um, he's had a number of books. Great Wall, Hidden Fortress is one of the, uh, also one of the key books that, even though it was written in the late 1990s, is still very viable and is in many, many uh, Chinese foreign policy classes across the U.S. and Europe. Um, his, some of his recent book is New Directions and the Study of Chinese Foreign Policy. He's had a number of articles in some of the most important journals, including World Politics, International Security, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Security Studies. And most recently, uh, at the end of last year, he wrote a very important piece in Foreign, Poli and foreign Affairs on the U.S. pivot. Um, and he might share a little bit about with us uh, today on some of that. Um, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, National Committee on U.S. Foreign Relations, just to name a few. But one of the most important things about Bob Ross is that he's very generous with his time. He's been very generous with his time with his students, with his colleagues, like here, and also with foreign policymakers. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Bob Ross. Thank you, John. When John talks like that, it makes me think of that wise saying, uh, be wary of friends bearing gifts. <laughs> uh, but I did survive the barbecue last night. John met me at the airport with some rib tips. So I want to reopen this. I'm not doing this. Oh, there we go. Let's go to the back door. Um, I'll just try to begin. Um, I can only talk about what I know. And this may be a conference on uh, China-Russia relations, but after Jeffrey's comments and others here, I dare not speak on that subject. What I know about is China, the rise of China, Chinese security issues, and U.S.-China relations. Uh, fortunately, Jeffrey gave me a nice, nice segue in talking about the Russian pivot to Asia and the implications of the U.S. pivot to Asia for China-Russia relations. And so if that's the context for understanding some part of China-Russia relations, that gives me some reason to talk about that today. I want to begin with two observations about U.S. policy in Asia. The first is, I think it's undeniable. That the situation in East Asia is worse today than any time in the last 30 years. Worse than any time since the end of the Cold War. We have a Sino, we have a Sino Japanese contention to see if Japan needs to kind of state. Sino Philippine relations, nasty conflict last year. Sino Vietnamese relations, and new threats of war in 2011. <clears throat> We have the Koreans are still doing nuclear tests and launching missiles. The Association for Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, is the most divided it's ever been since its creation in the late 1950s. This is the worst situation since East Asia for Malaysia, Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, South Korea, China, and it's the worst it's been since the end of the Cold War. None of this serves U.S. interests in stability or our larger purpose in state security. Second, it should be axiomatic that as the large, as the most powerful country in the world, that is the United States, other countries react to what we do. So, if you want 
don't understand why these things are so bad, let's not focus on, well, China did this, or Vietnam did that, or even North Korea did that. Nothing happened anywhere in the world, except maybe Central Asia. Without countries asking, what did America do and how do we respond? So it should be fairly self evident that if East Asia is the worst it's been since the end of the Cold War, the United States has a huge self responsibility. What I want to do is look at U.S. policy in the first four years of the Obama administration. <laughs> The, the shape, and ask how has it contributed to instability in East Asia? So I want to begin that by asking how we got here. Now, some of us with, with, with distant memories will remember 2010. Uh, <laughs> that was a nasty year. The number of Chinese provocations over fairly marginal issues at the long run. Loud protest against a U.S. carrier doing operations in the Yellow Sea. Over the top reaction to the Japanese arrest of a drunken Chinese fisherman who ran the Chinese, a Japanese Coast Guard ship. A propaganda campaign against the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to, the, to a Chinese citizen that reminded many people of Nazi Germany in Increased arrest of Vietnamese fishermen. This handling of the Copenhagen Global Warming Conference, which ended in, in, in a lackluster agreement, who was where people blame China. The Chinese position was no different than India, no different than other countries. They just mismanaged their development. Now, this created a challenge for the United States. You know, here we are in 2010 in the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. The Chinese, on the other hand, are going at 10% a year in the middle of this global financial crisis after 30 years of economic growth and 15 years of double digit increase in percent. The whole region looks to the United States and says, Where are you? China's behaving in a belligerent, assertive way. You've done this since, like, since the end of the Cold War. You balanced the rise of China. Are you still there? So there was indeed a challenge for the United States to respond in ways that would reassure the region that we could be dependent on to balance China. And of course, simultaneously, we had to find ways to stick with China. That for whatever reason you're acting the way you're acting, don't think we just roll over. Now, we did a number of things that were quite constructive. And they're the list of fairly long. Term. March 2010, for the first time since the Cold War, three U.S. nuclear power submarines, attack submarines, surfaced simultaneously in these days. Many people noticed, but those who did, those who do pay attention, we had a human rights issue with, with Indonesia. We wouldn't have a nil-nil relationship with Indonesia. Well, in you know, 2010, we decided to look the other way. We opened up nil-nil with Indonesia. New Zealand. You remember New Zealand's nuclear allergy. Well, when they said you can't have any nuclear te technologies come into uh, New Zealand waters, we said thank you very much, but we're suspending our lives in New Zealand. 2010, ah, we'll, we'll figure out how, a way to get around. But let's re engage the alliance cooperation. We expanded U.S. Philippine relations. The um, U.S. aircraft carrier presence grew considerably. We um, increased the U.S. Japan cooperation, including greater joint exercise over disputed territory. All this had the effect of saying to our traditional allies in East Asia, we're there. But we did other things. And I would suggest we're counterproductive. And I frame this by saying, again, the challenge was there. But just as the Chinese responded disproportionately to the challenges to their security in 2010, we responded disproportionately to the Chinese challenge. What we did is we reversed U.S. security policy in East Asia that had been established by both the Bush and the Clinton administration. And the McCoy 
call your attention to these reversals, but simply want to note now that no one before 2010 showed any dissatisfaction with Bush administration policy that was in those days. The first thing we did is we reversed policy or we developed new policy of disputed territories in the South China Sea. It was mentioned earlier that we don't interfere in the disputes in the South China Sea. That's not quite true. Secretary of State Clinton in Hanoi, July 2010, said the United States supports multi excuse me, collaborative negotiations among all the claimants. Well, that was a nice finely two diplomatic word, but collaborative negotiations among all the claimants means multilateral negotiations. That's the Philippine position, that's the Vietnamese position, that's not the Chinese. Widely understood in the region that we were backing them against. How do we reach that position? We consulted with every ASEAN country, all 10 of them, except China. If you study 19th century Bismarckian diplomacy, we would say we isolated China. And where did she say it? She said it in Hanoi. Not Hawaii, not Washington. She said it in Hanoi. What was prior policy? Prior policy on these same islands was made by assistant and deputy assistant secretaries in Washington, not in Hanoi. And the line they used was the United States has an interest in freedom of navigation and peace and resolution. He said, okay. That was enough to get the region's attention. So the United States speaks. He did that twice, maybe three times, since 1996. Unnecessary? I'm going to re emphasize something. These islands are worthless. I want a Google image to take a look at. <laughs> they are worthless. The Malaysians have built an airstrip on one of them. There's only room for an airstrip. There's not enough room to put tanks to refuel on. There's not enough. You can't pull a ship in to refuel your aircraft. It's a worthless <coughs> airstrip. Two things to think about South the island. Anyone can take them, no one can hold them. Second, they don't aid in power projection. You need power projection to defend the island. They are procedurally worthless. Second, they have no oil. That is a call project. My source, just this week, United States uh, Energy Administration, just this week said no oil in the South China Sea around the disputed island. Is there oil along the immediate literal with the special the special economic zone? Sure. But the further you leave the coast, it's these are worthless items. Yet we took a stand against Chinese sovereignty and supported them. Second thing we did, the United States reversed policy on Indochina. Now, by my thinking, the greatest tragedy of the Vietnam War is that we lost the Vietnam of America. Vietnam was never a valuable piece of real estate. Wasn't a piece of valuable real estate in Deep Ash in 1950 when Deep Ash was left it out? In the late 40s when the Joint Chief said it was unimportant? But it wasn't a valuable piece of real estate in the 1960s or 70s. It was still not a valuable piece of real estate. Of course, don't tell the Chinese that. It's probably the most valuable piece of real estate they got. At the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Russians, the Vietnamese turned around and they said, oh my god, we just lost our out of town friend. Who's going to help us against China? You never see anyone pull out of Cambodia so fast in your life. Tell us what you want, we'll leave China. They left. But they simultaneously started looking around for new friends. That was us. Arms length. We've been there, we've done that. Thanks very much. But we're not very interested in establishing defense cooperation with Vietnam. 2010, that all changed. 2010, the Secretary of State visited Vietnam twice in six months. Secretary of Defense visited in those same six months. Three high level visits to Hanoi. Six months. We held the first US Vietnam joint naval exercise. December of that year. This was very active for six months. The Secretary called for a US Vietnam strategic partnership with Vietnam. So why are we doing this? Uh, and 
These partnerships, by the way, if you look for the baby, we have like a hundred of them around the world. They're not cheap. So if you do the budget cutting, it's a battle place you might not might be a place you might not want to go into. USS George Washington paid a visit just off 12 miles, ferried out to the to the George Washington, being to be civil military leader. For symbolic purposes, the USS Decay paid a visit to the Kabbalah Bay. Since then, annual military exercises, a U.S. Vietnam uh, memorandum on military cooperation, um, the U.S. Vietnam memorandum on uh, civil nuclear sharing. And somewhere deep in there, there are discussions ongoing about an aircraft carrier visit out to Taiwan Bay. It's not deep enough, but to um, today, I thought that. Cambodia. We now have ground forces cooperation between the Cambodian army. Cambodia now participates in the uh, carrot exercises with the Navy in the South China Sea. Vietnam. Got excuse me, Cambodia. Does anyone think that Cambodia is dating from a contribution to American maritime security in East Asia? Right? Number three, reversal of Bush administration policy. Now, I, I'm careful not to say, I shouldn't really say Bush, I have to say Donald Trump. Because I'm not sure how much the president was engaged in this issue. Um, in about 2004, well, it was 2003, actually. We had a crisis with the uh, North Korea. Uh, and the South Koreans couldn't race fast to the Beijing to talk to Beijing about how to contain America. So here we are, we have a coercive diplomacy against North Korea, and the South Koreans are undercutting us as fast as they can. And the Secretary of Defense said, you know, look, they don't want us there, they don't want to cooperate, what are we doing there? And second, I think the Secretary had a long view of history. He saw the Chinese shadow coming over the peninsula. He also had a similar view of Taiwan. He says, you know, this is a losing game. Great power shifts are going to change this issue. And we see South Korea beginning to try and make those adjustments. So under Rumsfeld, <coughs> we reduced our troop presence in South Korea by 40%. Under Rumsfeld, we took our troops out from between the DMZ and Seoul. Those deployments were there. We have a couple dozen left. Who and the, uh, the visitor booth at the DMZ. The frequency and size of our annual military exercises with South Korea dropped precipitously. So by the end of the Bush administration, they were infrequent and small. And then fourth, in the 2008, 2008, Uh, QDR, written by the Bush administration, we promised that we would hand over two sets of public, right? this is a policy statement, <coughs> we will turn over to South Korea in the year 2012, the operational command of South Korea. These, this is a retrenchment. This is a disengagement. In part because I haven't met a single colonel who says, what are we doing in South Korea? They don't need our help. They can defeat the North Koreans without our help. Deter to something else again. You want to deter his presence and let the South North Koreans know that if you do something stupid, you, know, you got us to handle it. Right? And that's different than an on-the-ground presence required to defend. The difference between 40,000, 20,000, 25,000 is irrelevant. Our administration increased our troop presence, increased the scope, the size, and frequency of, of annual exercise. And deferred from 2012 to 2015 to handing over operational command. Um, it has longer range plans to increase the U.S. Uh, equipment presence and strategic presence in South Korea. Okay, well, we do. If you thought there was a North Korean threat that required American presence, then how come your troops aren't standing between Seoul and the DMZ to help defend Seoul? When you pull those troops out of the DMZ area, you made a very clear message that our troops weren't needed to fight a war. So why are they going back in? You know, if you're sitting in China, there's only one explanation. It's China. If you're looking at Vietnam, what are the Americans doing with Vietnam? There's only one explanation. It's China. 
And when you are popping, you're changing your South China Sea territory of the fuse policy. So after 20, 30 years of fly with one side against another, you're able to get the Now, my problem with this, it's not that we didn't have a challenge in 2010, we did. But there was no need to reassure the allies we had identified as strategically important to the United States to simultaneously move our policy back to where it was in the The reverse policy of Korea, Vietnam, and Korea. Those were electives, those were choices. Vietnam is not, Japan is not a choice. That's a requirement. In our academic setting, we'll say that's a core requirement. You gotta take that. Philippines, you gotta have it. Singapore, you need that base for the aircraft carriers of China, you gotta have it. Northern Australia, you gotta have that presence there outside of range of Chinese uh, medium range ballistic missiles. You gotta have it. This administration, they so didn't need South Korea. You didn't need Vietnam. Now, I preface this all by saying, please understand that I voted for President Obama. But there's no way to escape the conclusion that after four years, U.S. policy is worse today in Asia than it was four years prior. I can't find a legacy that I would be proud of. Now, the problem here is the American, the American pivot, you don't need to worry about it. Why? Because the Americans got an economic crisis, they're a declining power, we're a rising power, you know, give it time. They're not saying that this is a benign policy. They're not saying that this is not a hostile policy. They're simply saying, Americans pay the price. The policy prescription for this is maintain peaceful lives, maintain cooperation. But this is somewhat of an instrumental argument. People who are making this argument tend to be American friends. They like peaceful lives. They like U.S. China cooperation. So they're spinning the analysis to say, no need to worry. Peaceful lives, we can still maintain our prior policy. And there's the other group. I haven't seen the word container used so much in China ever as I see it now. Now, there are people who are smarter, they'll say, no, you can't use the word containment, that's the word for the Soviet Union, the theological conflict, economic conflict. No, this is not containment, it's just a circle. So that word we'll see a lot more of. And you can't really blame them. <laughs> After all, we were establishing a far greater foreign presence than we had four years earlier in South Korea and Vietnam. And we're signing our sovereignty. Now, when you do this to a great power, they're going to react. Because if they don't react, they're giving a free ride to the United States to keep on doing what they're doing. In international politics, you want a country to change, you impose costs. Right? What is power? Power is the ability to get, to get a country to do what it otherwise wouldn't want to do. The Chinese want us to stop doing what we're doing. How do you do that? You use your power to, to change American assessment of the value of the pivot. The Chinese have to find ways to impose costs. This goes back to Jeffrey's comment about China, China Russia relations, and to the extent to which it drives that relationship, it will be determined by, in part, by how China views American policy. I would suggest you were already seeing a Chinese reaction that's been not super costly, but costly to them. I shouldn't say that. Uh, not super costly, but it's very costly. One place we've seen that is in Syria. The Chinese have the Russians back on Syria. Now, in the old days, the Chinese would say of such issues as human rights in the Middle East and elsewhere, you get the other countries on board, you'll have us on board. And then they step back. And so what they explicitly say, you get the Russians on board, we're on board. The body language is different. They're working hand in hand. So the Chinese went into Damascus to have an effort to systematically resolve this. The consultation was based on this. Recall, Secretary of State Clinton called Chinese behavior despicable. Use if you want to try and manage relations with the power. But she was talking about Chinese behavior in the U.S. Security Council, vetoing the Security Council resolution. Second place. Iran. 
latest round of sanctions against Iran are outside the UN Security Council table. Why is that? Because we said we said um, very state or you know, I know it, to to Iran, but he was looking for support for a UN Security Council resolution. We sent it to Beijing, sorry, and the Chinese said, Well come here to support. Sure, well, the veto threat, not a threat, the veto promise was there. So we didn't even go to the UN Security Council resolution. Went to Europe, and the official Council. Chinese found a way to agree to the last five UN Security Council resolutions. So they said, don't even ask. Don't try to see. Pushing back on Vietnam, pushing back on the Philippines. What's the Chinese image? These small, excuse me, Chinese have a great power to over this, you would think. These small, inconsequential countries are challenging Chinese sovereignty. Where do they get the wherewithal to do that? Oh, they got American power. That just drives the Chinese to be all the more belligerent in response to these activities. So you get a Chinese Philippine standoff of a worthless piece of horrible South China Sea. You get this Chinese that threatened the Vietnamese with war in 2011 and asked for relationship. All this is the Chinese pushback. Oh, something else in Iran. After we reached agreement with the European countries on sanctions on Iranian oil, the Chinese turned around and signed a large scale deal with the Iranians. Now, they haven't implemented it for an interesting reason. Because the Chinese National Oil Company want to start getting deals in America. And the first question Congress is going to ask before they approve that is what are they doing in Iraq? So their commercial interests are keeping them honest in Iraq. But the larger scale diplomacy is they would offer, they signed that deal, and that, now they're bickering over price. And who knows what, you know, there's leverage out there that they're so the U.S.-China relationship is also the worst it's been. We have problems over Taiwan. We've had embassy bombing in Belgrade. We had an EP3 go down over Hainan. Those were instances. The larger trend of a stable relationship. We have a new strategic trend in which America is challenging the regional order for Chinese security around its border. I'm also going a lot, at least in summer, in lockdown, which he did. All the body language that this is so much better stuff. Going together. Now, yeah. two more comments. First is, it might have been understandable. China's challenge in 2010 reflected a confident China pushing back against the regional order. But that's simply not true. 2010, China suffered the greatest economic crisis in its history since 1962, right before, early 1960s. It was a disaster. You recall the American discussion. You had key lead economists say, look, China managed the global financial crisis well. We should learn from them. God says, they still did not. How could you grow at 10 percent a year when the entire world was crashing? It's not possible. What they did is they just poured money into that system. Four trillion rent and be within a few within six months. Back. You want to dislocate, you want a dysfunctional policy and how to manage the economy that was it. Massive debt throughout the system. Local government debt, central government debt, bank debt, uh, state-owned corporations. Still, the debt is off the charts. Now, what happened was, Chinese only have, there were three forms of growth consumption, exports, and investment. Chinese don't have consumption growth because the Chinese people save like crazy. You could save too. If you went to the hospital and they said you have any money to pay for surgery, if you didn't have it, you don't need surgery. So they save like crazy. So, 
Hawaii got an export and the best. They lost their exports in 2010. So how do you vote the walk of auto? So how do you compensate? If you're growing at 10% a year in 2010, you're using investment to compensate for the loss of that for export. Yeah, but the moral the inflation in that year was not the charge. We ten times the one year. Unemployment remained off the chart besides the stimulus. The housing bubble was massive. Local government debt skyrocketed 300%. Bank loans are just now we're realizing how bad loans are uh, on the bank's accounting sheet because it takes a few years in order to get that loan. So what else happened in that year? Well, in 2009, 2010, the internet was For the by 2010, 60% of Shanghai, 60, over 60% of Shanghai and Beijing were connected to the web. Now, one of the two things that does is it lets the whole country know just how corrupt the Chinese Communist Party is. That's what it does. The second, it means all those nationalists in China were deposited. The nationalism got worse because the Chinese, they kept seeing this, this aircraft carrier program and this J 15 and this J 20 and this. And the space shot, and they said, China's powerful now. And our governors are such wimps, we have to use our power. Well, so you have the combination of social instability, economic instability, rising nationalism, talking to each other on the web. The government says, oh, the last, this is the last thing we do is to challenge our nationalism. So we didn't see this crowd confidently trying to push it back. We saw a scared strike. Membership scared of instability. And for the first time since the rise of China in the 1980s, the Chinese government decided to appease their nationalism rather than appease the global system. And the price they paid was a disastrous result in 2010, which, by the way, won't they try to draw to a close in December 2010? That was too late. The word went out in 2010, December. No, this has not been a good year. We turned to peaceful. Now, I say they weren't confident for the other second reason. If I were in the Navy, the occupation would be force protection. I'd be worried about that carrier. 4,500 people, for 12 to 15 billion dollars. Those of you who watch this internet this week, we know we lost the ship on the shoals of the Philippines. The three leading commanders of that ship have just retired. Navy. Ability to work for me. Okay. Force protection. Protect that carrier. If you if that's your perspective, the Chinese are really not powerful. I don't work for me. I don't sell the carrier. I'm not concerned about who's I'm concerned about losing the But I'm concerned about look, who's gonna win that war? With how much certainty? The baseline to understand American power in the world. Is from 1989 to 2005, when the entire every ocean of the world was basically American lake. Look, when the British ruled the seas, they never thought they could fight a war not in ships. They just knew they could fight the war and win. So the world is becoming normal. Great powers are rising to balance American power. But there's a war; we're going to lose ships. It's just normal. But the Chinese have not deployed a single weapon from 2010 or the prior 10 years that challenged America to have a peace treaty with the world. No one in the Chinese high command, no one in the Chinese civilian elite says, oh, we can now challenge America because our military is strong. No, we're 10 feet tall. We're still there. The third, throw this out there, the American tended to change American policy on the ground. This pivot began in 1997, the aftermath of the Taiwan Strait Conflict. We moved our first Los Angeles class submarine from Europe to Guam. Since then, every single weapon system is now a F-16, F-22, B-1 bombers, B-2s, Los Angeles class submarines, Virginia class submarines, the new SSDN or the Ohio class converts. Everything is there. We got a new base in Singapore in 1999. We allocate a second carrier to the region of the Bush administration. Everything is there. It's not as if we have forgotten. Oh, look, it's also important to remember how do we fund Afghanistan and Iraq? 
quarterly supplemental budget funded by Congress. The regular U.S. defense budget went on. This is how we do wars today. No one pays the price. So the regular U.S. defense budget went on as if we didn't have a war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what was its focus before 9-11? The only budget driver in the entire Pentagon before 9-11. After 9-11, if you were the Navy and Air Force, you didn't walk away. China didn't get much stronger, and we certainly didn't destroy the region. So the larger part of the economy made because all this is unnecessary. This is not a confidence struggle. Pushing at the end of it. This goes to China that was frightened. A necessarily elicited American response to retain American credibility in the region for resolve. We had to respond. But we seem to respond in the way that they contact people. For the fact they were scared of their own people, they still see America. Yeah. <laughs> and if you really want to talk about Korea, we can talk about Korea. There's a line in Hamlet where it talks about when honor is at stake, it doesn't matter if you're fighting on the street. But I'm wondering if Bradley, and it might not be in there, but it's a question of honor, that's against the sign. Fair enough. I think there are two elements here. So let's take, for example, something that's even less controversial. The Yasukuni Shrine in Japan back in the middle of the last century. Who cares if the Japanese Prime Minister goes to the Suma Shrine once a year? But the Chinese have told the Japanese government, this is important to us. Don't do it. This is important to us. Don't do it. And then he says, I'm going to do it. Well, you know, it's kind of like putting up a middle finger. Right? <laughs> and any country will say, I'm being challenged. So what does it say? Your credibility, your resolve, you're trying to be pushed around. So at that level, you're going to get a response. Now, is that pride? Or is that simply an understanding that your credibility is important to your power? I think both are wrong. In a similar way, the Yasukuni Shrine, the whole region was watching. This was a sign of Japanese face off. So China had rising power credibility, and they just backed down to Japan. Again, you know, prestige versus, versus credibility. Now, I think it's certainly something the Chinese people watch, this internationalism of it, again. So for the Chinese leadership, the issue has been, we need to respond in ways that let the region know that this is important. But they can do that at a much lower level. But then how do you appease your national side if, if you're not aware of the subtleties of the diplomacy? So I think much of the level of hostility reflects the domestic order. So I think you would have gotten pushed back at all these issues. Particularly Vietnam, but plenty of those issues. I see on three sides. But you would have gotten pushed back on all of them. But the level of vitriol, particularly with Japan, makes every so I mean, Japan case we were talking earlier. When the Japanese um government bought the there was anti-Japanese violence in a hundred Chinese cities that were close to six. This is one just how vitriolic Chinese nationalism is. But two, you know, Chinese talk about the humiliation of the past. I'd be humiliated if I had a government that couldn't keep order. Right? This is a government that's so frightened of its people, that the Chinese refuse to constrain them. Uh, so I think that tells us just how sensitive they are to the domestic. I was wondering, uh, okay, yesterday the uh, fifth down the road was the use of Chinese debt. Oh, yeah. And then that happened in the U.S. a couple of years ago, and people still luckily kept buying the Treasury bonds. I was wondering if you would see more and more of this economic. Um, you say China is the engine of growth around the world. It's true. Depending, if you want to talk about power, China's the most powerful economy, the most important economy in the world. Why? Because power and economics comes from your market. I export to you my GDP is higher. I export to you I make jobs. I export to you my government's stable because my economy and jobs are doing well. If you're growing at 10% a year in China, you're creating a lot of jobs around the world. That's power. 
The United States grows at 2% a year, we're just not for the creating jobs. So, if you watch the stock exchange on a daily basis, and then it goes up and you read below what, what the news of the day is, oh, China. Exports went up. Oh, exports down, stock exchange is down. It's driving the stock exchange. It got downgraded because of debt. Chinese debt as a share of GDP is really high. Global government debt, debt is faster, bad loans on the, on the banks are disaster. And the problem the Chinese have is the only way to bring debt under control, right? so they lost consumption as a share of growth. They don't have consumption as a share of growth. They don't have exports, because Europe is still a basket case and we're growing at 1% a year. So the only way they can they can reduce debt is to lower investment, because they lower investment, the economy is going to really go really. So if the economy slows down to let's say four or five percent, then unemployment busts. And when unemployment busts, you got to really scare them. So I don't know whether the Chinese government has the political courage to make the decision necessary to straighten their account. Now, at the extreme case, the extreme analogy would be Latin America in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, where they end up with hyperinflation and collapse. And of course, we're seeing that in Venezuela today. Why? Because these are single party authoritarian states. Remember, China's not communist, China's a single party authoritarian state. So single party authoritarian states are scared to death of employment. And so when they face that, that choice, sound economic policies are stimulants to keep them employment high. More often than not, they're going to wreck their economy. And that's the question for China. A lot of people aren't talking about it. Both for political reasons. For you and me, there are dysfunctional economic policies to correct. But the dysfunctional economic policy, at least the short one, will stimulate the economy to have that high growth that will create jobs and exports to keep the American economy going. And then maybe they'll become more dysfunctional only after we hear the bad out of our system. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Should be doing? No. Well, that gives me two, two things. Um, I am not an apologist for North Korea. I think we did my thing. <laughs> Having said that, I assume this is a perfectly rational government, and their objective is just different than ours. They want to stay in power and preserve their state. That's all they care about. Now, they have diplomacy with North Korea and characteristics that could be fairly self defeating but the one view for North Korea in the last six months was like this. You have a 29-year-old leader who I assume 80, 90, 99.9% of the country thinks is immense and unqualified for the job. So if you were that guy, you'd be scared to death. But you wouldn't want to get a bullet in your head because that's how successes work in North Korea. And, what you, and you spent so much time out of the country that you have no political base. You don't have friends. So that you don't have a power base, you don't have a faction, you don't have a support structure. You're trying to build one, but if you're still pretty weak, you're on your own. Second, the United States just imposed large sanctions on North Korea, supported by China. There goes your friend. Who are they siding with? You're siding with the other guy. When did North Korea begin their nuclear program? In the late 80s, 89, 90, when the Soviet Union collapsed and China went capitalist. And the South Koreans are taking off. And there's one little um, anecdote out there that the that the uh, South Korean, North Korean somebody up there, high, went to the Soviet ambassador to North Korea and said, "You normalize normalized relations with South Korea, we're going nuclear." To the South Korea. Well, here we are this year with the Chinese side with the Americans. What about isolation? Third thing that happens: the United States is conducting our annual military exercise with South. Now, if the peninsula have a common with Europe, that strategic theater is going to get. NATO was on 24 7 alert for how many years? Because the Soviet had that surprise attack that marched through the gap, they'd be in Paris for a week. If the North Koreans march through, the DMZ will be in Seoul in a day. But if we go first, that Korean government is dead. So, whenever the Soviet Union did 
joint exercise of the Warsaw Pact. We were a full height of it. But if we didn't know the military exercises of the friendly to attack or just an exercise, but they had thought it was a lesson. So here we are doing our large scale military exercise of the South Because every time we do these exercises of the South Korea, North Korea goes to the South. Because we could because there is no water separated, there is no mountain separated. Bang your fluid is there. And then we just did this little up plan with South Korea, where we announced that we would have a more forward leading role in case of war. I'd be scared. And if you don't have military capability, and you don't have an economic capability, how do you deter to persuade the other side you're crazy? <laughs> I mean, that's all you got, right? So I would expect that when our exercise are over South Korea, you begin to rack. Now, having said that, um, there was a, a headline in the online foreign policy journal, foreign policy diary, that said, who sent those destroyers to North Korea? Oh, the president didn't authorize it. Oh, the spec that didn't authorize it. Oh, maybe this is just a day one of piece of the action. Decided, oh, change to the Cuban Missile Crisis all over again, right? And you put the destroyers off the coast of North Korea, and that's firepower. Gash it up this whole thing a bit. Um, now, the article wasn't clear. The article said, well, maybe it was ordered, but it was supposed to be kept secret. Because they were here. Well, you can keep it secret because they have no idea what's going on. Oh, they don't have radar systems. So some public affairs officer may have leaked it. Well, come on, guys. We can do better than that, right? Now, what should we be doing? We have ratcheted this down so quickly. We had a recent announcement that our war plan for North Korea is a Pittsburgh cat. Year for year, and eye for eye. Eye for eye, for eye. That is to say, we're not going to go nuclear. We're not going to go massive. If, if something, if a mistake happens, if this one goes off the wrong side, don't worry. We're not going to level your We've lowered our rhetoric. It's a good thing. We have deferred a a missile test. Because I think everyone is really nervous. Not because North Korea would start a war. No one thinks North Korea would start a war. On purpose. They're afraid of one or two things. Some missile goes awry, they think it's a cat, and boom, up it goes. Or two, they think we're going to attack. So we ratcheted this down. Where are we going in the future? You know, you got two choices. You got, you got two choices. You continue to posture because the whole world is watching. And if you don't posture, they'll think you've lost or given up. That's not a good thing. Or you find a way to walk away. Walk away with you. After all, this has been a policy failure. We've tried to deal with their nuclear weapon program for 20 years now. And it's bad. They now have 10 nuclear bombs. They have a, a very robust missile, uh, missile program. It's not going to work. It's just not. So you can keep failing. We did this UN sanctions. Then a week they had a, a nuclear test. Well, you will keep a middle finger to see what it is, right? Now, I don't know. Maybe they timed it that way. Maybe it's just. But, but every time we seem to do something, they do that. It doesn't work. My own preference, I'd rather quiet no. I'd rather loudly walk away. The Japanese are watching. The Japanese. This is what people are for. To find a way to disengage them from the issue without everyone thinking you lost. Because I think the price of defeat each time is very high. And North Korea is gained a lot this time, by the way. South Korea's market is plummeting, people evacuating. Oh, they just proved their power. North Korea just proved they have the ability to destabilize <coughs> South Korea. That's how it is. I don't see how any of this helps us. I've got the mic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> From the Russian side, they've been looking at North Korean provocations. And they essentially believe that the North Koreans have gotten into a bad business of engaging in provocation as the sign that they want to negotiate. And in essence, they pushed the South Koreans into a position where the escalations are more costly domestically in South Korea, and the South Koreans got to do something. Uh, witnessed the patrol boat that got sunk and the shelling off the coast. Um, how do we play that? South Korea doesn't want war. No one wants war. Um, we will 
facts still really work. Our objective is to reassure South Korea that the balloon goes up there. Now, we did this in 1996 for the Taiwan Strait crisis. I sent two aircraft carriers within the vicinity of Taiwan, 200 miles from the north of Wuhan, 200 miles from the south. And the whole region noticed, bang, right? You don't need to do much for the United States. You lose some forces. I don't think that's hard enough. Now, one thing to observe is how the Chinese deal with this. Chinese are really angry. In part, they're angry because 2010 was a disaster. The North Koreans sunk that ship, and the Chinese walked the North Korean leader to Beijing. What the hell are you doing? Right? right? And so they lost a lot of goodwill in South Korea. And then you had what I would call a right wing president of South Korea, who was going to be anti North Korea cooperating with America. And so you had all these activities that changed the Bush administration policy. So if you're the Chinese, one, you lost your goodwill, and you're seeing a bolstering of the U.S.-South Korean defense relationship, is of course, with China. So you want to walk this back. You really want to walk this relationship back with South Korea. And you know you can do it, because the South Koreans were unhappy with, with the state of South Korea and China relations. And you had a new Chinese leader, you had a new South Korean leader, everything was working well, the North Korean cooperative was in. Forcing him to choose. That could be very serious. So, one thing, if you see Chinese help on North Korea, I don't think it reflects the willingness to work with the United States. I think one, they're so angry and they want. So, what they're doing is they can't abandon North Korea. They just can't. You got a leader who could get a bullet in his head tomorrow. You don't want to pull the rug out from under him without proof. Right? As much as they'd like, there was a photo yesterday of the bridge from South Korea over, the, over the North Korea, and there's just as much problems there as there. They can't afford to have a good economy for North Korea. But they got to find a way. So what are they doing? They're isolating North Korea. The new Chinese leader wrote a letter to President Park, the new South Korean leader. Then he called her up. He said, let's cooperate together with this issue. You had um, Obama talk to, um, no, it was Kerry, talk to Xi Jinping. They talked to the Chinese foreign minister, Yang Jiechi, or the Chinese back in there. Talked to the state council. Again, let's see if we can cooperate. So they're trying to diplomatically isolate North Korea, persuade others they want to cooperate while trying to not destabilize them. That I think is what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, if our um, isolation policy doesn't work, how we can engage North Korea constructively in order to uh, solve this problem? We cannot have this hard maybe all the time. Yeah, engage with North. Um, the, the country with the best engagement policy is, of course, China. That's a very active border with consumer goods, cell phones, air conditioners, television, going back and forth that's exposing South Korean society <coughs> to what the world is like, creating domestic sources of reform. They're doing the best job there. If we could, we should do that. Because if you don't like the South Korean government, if you isolate them, you're not going to make it happen. And in fact, we learned this in our few days. There are two problems dealing with that. One is the South Koreans, North Koreans don't want to trade with them. I mean, if they wanted to trade with the world, there were a number of countries that would be out there looking to invest there, looking to trade with them. But the idea that they would, you know, it's only in the last three or four years they found out what the Chinese did. Because every investment and every trade is a, is a signal to the North Korean people that your government's bankrupt. Second issue is, it's hard Remember, a diplomat's job is to walk away from something without looking like you're defeated. If we start doing that, the whole region goes to defeat. We've abandoned containment, we've abandoned coercion, we've given up, and now we want to trade with them. That's hard to do. It's hard to keep the South Korean comfortable with the United States. It's hard to keep the, the Japanese confidence that we're going to resist this North Korean nuclear program. The next thing you know, you're abandoning your country. I just, yeah, well, yeah, but it took us 10 or 15 years. They weren't acting to have a nuclear program to threaten the American ally. You know, this is, you know, this is a threatening American ally, and Japan feels threatened. And, you know, so, you know, uh, but remember, it's, uh, it's the case, you know, remember Jimmy Carter wanted to have a major aid program to North Korea, and the Congress said no. It takes years. Yeah. From our uh, online audience, uh, we have a question. Actually, it's breaking news as uh, North Korea is uh, fueling two intermediate range missiles, and the Pentagon reporting a potential death for launches. Well, go back to go back to what was over here. 
I haven't heard bluster from the Pentagon. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But the uh, Secretary Hagel says uh, North Korea is uh, about to cross a very dangerous line. So in the context of this, how does walk it back help in this particular situation? I don't know how to walk it back. No, look, I think we're all just trying to lower the temperature and wait till our exercise is over. That's all we're doing. Mr. Ross, what do you think North Korea really wants? In the new event, how would you qualify the strategic uh, trend or culture of China? I think what North Korea wants. Defensive, want, defensive, what? But I think what North Korea wants is nuclear weapons. They just do. I mean, you'd want them if you were North Korea. You lost every friend you have in the world, and they come to you on the other side of the DMZ is 10 times more powerful than you are. How are you going to survive? This is Pakistan. This is Israel, right? This is what South Africa did. And you take the small pariah states without friends, they all go to They just do. So that's one thing they want. Second thing they want is they want to stay in power at all costs, right? I mean, that is, and you know, the nightmare of the North Korean leadership, I call the Ceausescu outcome. <laughs> and then, no, I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> I mean, being lynched in the streets of, of, of Pyongyang is, is a great fear. So it's not keeping the government intact, it's keeping the police intact. Okay. Um, and given those two things, so, uh, can we reassure them of that and say, don't worry, you can have any nuclear weapons and we, won't, we don't want to overthrow you? But there are two problems with that. American promises are worth the paper they're written on. But that's okay. No country's promises are worth the paper they're written on. I mean, that's just, well, would you believe us if you were there? <laughs> the idea we give a non-aggression treaty would work, and it's just not going to work. But then second, <laughs> yes. You mentioned the uh, problem of opening up uh, because of the foreign investment. And I know we have kind of a, uh, a Korean version of the Kiyodora. Uh, above the DMZ, do they have the same thing uh, on the China borders uh, that uh, would be the equivalent of the old Makiadoras on the Mexican border here? Uh, for the free trade zone? Yeah, for the, the free, free trade, trade zone, zone the manufacturing and the, the Chinese side. have been pouring a lot of money into North Korea. They don't. They don't. I mean, they tried one 20 years ago and never went anywhere. But since North Korea has been opening up the Chinese aid, the Chinese are doing joint ventures. Major infrastructure projects by rail to connect their ports to China, and major infrastructure projects to um, expand their ports. So what you just see is a larger Chinese state-owned enterprise presence in North Korea doing this kind of work. And from what we can tell, it's not slowing down. But you know, I guess that's a good thing. You know, I mean, you know, you know two sides of the same coin. We used to say, look, if you want a country to be able to negotiate, you have to give them some confidence. Well, they give you confidence. We will be better to deal with. On the other hand, if you want a country to negotiate, you gotta you gotta isolate them. I don't know what's the right one. All I know is that relatively speaking, they have created a state of I think that the young leaders recently made it clear that they want nuclear weapons that they carry the United States, but they still want economic support. I think you know, how do you do that? I don't know. But I think they see the Chinese as part of that reform process. Thank you. Can we go back to this nuclear issue one more time? Uh, specifically, they are, as you said earlier, developing. Oh, the, oh, oh, I remember. The rocket thing. Oh, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. The last time we promised the country, if you give up nuclear weapons, we will overthrow you. Yeah. <laughs> right. The lesson for these countries is don't give up your nuclear weapons. That's the question. <laughs> yeah. All right. The, the issue is uh, uh, two questions. One is two parts to it. One is they are developing the missile technology, and two is they have not yet miniaturized their nuclear capabilities so that they can put it on that. Should we let them do that? Uh, or should we do something before they uh, before they do that? You're absolutely right. That is to say, they haven't miniaturized the warhead to put them on a missile. And that's going to take a long time. I mean, uh, can the missile reach America? Maybe, but it might be able to blow up a building because it's not going to have to the warhead on it. So we shouldn't exaggerate the North Korean threat to Alaska or even to Japan or anywhere else. But then second, you raise it. Part of what I think is driving us today, I mean, the American reaction recently has been far greater than any prior administration in our ratcheting this up. And I think part of it's what you're talking about. I still don't. 
I think the next stage for Rule 3 is the relevant missile system that can reach America, and that's a far greater threat. And that might reinvigorate our efforts to deal with the North Korean regime, because that's a bridge too far. But I don't know what to do. I mean, you look, they could drop a nuclear, they could drop a nuclear device on Seoul. They could smuggle a nuclear device into Seoul. I don't know. I'm not so do these things. But they have a retaliatory capability that can obliterate an American ally, and we have a lot of Americans in that country. So, you know, they have a retaliatory capability that makes American action. We would have done a surgical strike on North Korea decades ago. Decades. But if you're North Korea, you probably have a launch on warning policy. So as soon as those jets cross in, those missiles, they're hitting their buttons. I mean, we have to assume they do because we have to assume they wouldn't survive unless they had a launch on warning policy. So we've been deterred from doing a surgical strike. Not the term with Iran, we're just debating whether you want to do it or not. We're deterred, well, we are deterred. But North Korea were deterred because of the nuclear capability. I don't know how you deal with that. I don't know. Well, as we'd like to see the conflict come to an end, this talk does have to come to an end. So, please give.